It's good to see some suit to study folks in the room. It's good to see everybody. So I'm really happy you're all here and I'm very delighted to um, introduce Shyla Catherine tonight. Grateful that she's been willing to come to common ground via this fancy technology we have here to be with our community. And before I introduce Shyla, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge the momentous day that we've had today. So many of you are probably feeling a lot of things, some relief. I see some, um, yeah, excited hand gestures and maybe a whole lot more um, as we've received the news of the verdict today in the Chauvin trial. And if you don't know, guilty in all three counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, you know, so much moving there, of course, and really moving our attention to this deep Dharma practice that we're in that really supports our connection with all of the activities of the mind and the activities of the world. And so when, on that, I'm really glad to have Shyla here and sharing her wisdom and compassion with, with all of us. Many of you have been studying her book um, for I think a year or more. How long, Focused and Fearless? How long, somebody jump in, tell me how long you've been studying Focused and Fearless. About a year, Robin says. Yeah, great. So it's um, great. And I just came off of, I did a, a course through BCBS on the meta practices with Shyla. It was wonderful. Um, and so I, I really got a taste of the the depth of her practice and um, teaching skills as, as well. So I'm glad that we're all gonna get to share in that tonight. And I'd like to just do a, perhaps a bit more formal of an introduction, share a little bit about Shyla's history before I turn it over to her. Shyla is the founder of Insight Meditation South Bay, a meditation group in Silicon Valley, and also Bodhi Courses, an online Buddhist classroom. She has been practicing meditation since 1980 with more than nine years of accumulated silent retreat practice. She has taught since 1996 in the United States and internationally. She studied with many Asian masters in India and Thailand and Nepal. Um, in addition to the founders of several Western meditation centers. She completed a one-year intensive meditation retreat with the focus on concentration and jhana and authored Focused and Fearless, a meditator's guide to states of, states of deep joy, calm, and clarity, which she'll be speaking on tonight. And Shiloh practiced under the guidance of Venerable Paak Saida from 2006 to 2015 and also authored Wisdom Wide and Deep, a practical handbook for mastering jhana and vipassana, which I'm just starting to read now, and to make this traditional approach to meditative training accessible to Western practitioners. In 2014, Shiloh founded Bodhi Courses to develop and offer teachings in an online classroom. And I'm going to post a link um, to an upcoming course that she has in just a minute here. So you can check the chat for that. But for now, I just want to say thank you, Shiloh, for joining us. Wonderful to have you here and looking forward to the evening together. Well, thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I was so delighted to hear that you're spending a nice length of time, just about a year to read my little book, <laughs> Focused and Fearless, because I do think that the topic of concentration can pack a lot of profound uh, concepts into a, a, um, a, a modest book. So I'm delighted that you're taking the time to nourish those teachings and hopefully be practicing them. So uh, I, I 
I'm delighted to get to share a little bit more on the theme of concentration, which will at this point probably be quite familiar to those of you that have read Focused and Fearless, but I enjoy um, sharing these ideas in any case, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers, and I'll be very, very happy to entertain questions about anything regarding concentration, my book, the approach to concentration and jhana, or your practice around concentration. Concentration is described in the discourses of the Buddha as being the basis for wisdom. In several places, the Buddha declared, develop concentration. One who is concentrated understands things as they really are. Concentration is the ground for wisdom to arise because it's when the mind is deeply settled and steady that we're able to see things clearly, to see things as they are, to penetrate not only the nature of the object that we're perceiving, but also the subtle layers of experience that are involved in the process of cognition. If the mind doesn't settle, then we might have a certain degree of insight into the restlessness of the mind, but there's so much more to wisdom than understanding the way that the mind is habitually distracted. We need steadiness in order to sustain a quality of awareness that will be able to penetrate the deeper layers of, of experience and to understand and actually see for ourselves with penetrative insight the way that clinging forms and the way that eye-making and mind-making occur. How is it that we grasp at experience? How is it that we distort our perceptions through attachment? By developing concentration, we clear away those distortions and we learn a great deal about how we perceive things. Concentration is the term that I generally use to translate the word samadhi. Samadhi is described in the suttas as having four qualities being um, internally steadied, composed or settled, unified and concentrated. And we might find different teachers using different terms. Some might emphasize the aspect of unification and use the, and, and describe it as a unification of mind or the stillness or stability of mind, a collectedness, a one-pointedness, a focused attention or undistractedness. Concentration basically has the characteristic of non-dispersal non-dissipation, non-scatteredness, non-agitation, and it produces a strength to the mind. It's generally pleasant and linked with happiness and joy. It gives rise to a quality of joy that is said to be born of seclusion. And it's associated with the experience of tranquility, of calmness, of ease, of peace, of steadiness, of deep equanimity, bliss, rapture, stillness. It really sounds quite wonderful, I think. I think it's an attractive quality, one that many people hunger for and want to develop. So I want to talk a little bit about two kinds of samadhi that many of you have probably been developing in the course of your Buddhist practice. The first is what's called fixed samadhi. And this is when we strengthen concentration by focusing on a single object. And this can develop so strongly if the object is suitable um, and the conditions are ripe to permit a deep absorption and unification of mind with the object. Fixed samadhi in Pali is called apana samadhi, and it's usually developed with a mental concept as the object. Absorption or jhana practice represents one type of apana samadhi. 
But there are 40 different objects presented in the Theravada tradition that are considered to be suitable objects for concentration practice. And this includes using the breath, colors, elements, the Brahma Viharas of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, the various um, uh, casinas that develop through the elements, the body parts, loving um, the corpse meditations. There are also some reflections that develop a steadiness of mind, a some quality of samadhi and are included in these potential objects, but don't have the capacity to, to lead to absorption. And these objects are distinguished from the objects that we would use for vipassana practice. We develop another kind of samadhi when doing insight meditation, vipassana practice, because our object is changing. So the samadhi that develops with changing objects is called kanaka samadhi sometimes in English called momentary concentration. And it develops out of a continuity in our observation of the arising and passing of mental and material physical experiences. Moment to moment, there's concentration with whatever is present. So there's a, there's a development of a steadiness, even though the various perceptions that are arising are changing. But whether we're developing fixed or momentary samadhi, either quality of samadhi produces samadhi. It produces a concentrated mind that disentangles us from the complexities, the distractions and the proliferations of the discursive mind. So we become steady, focused, one pointed, either on the moment as it's changing on the arising and passing of mind and body processes or on a fixed and pre-selected meditation object. Right Samadhi is considered one of the factors on the Noble Eightfold Path, Sama Samadhi, right concentration. But we find it also included in many other Buddhist lists. It's one of the 10 paramis, one of the seven factors of awakening, one of the five powers and five spiritual faculties. Right Samadhi is very frequently defined as corresponding with the four absorptions called the four jhanas. These are four states of profound and steady attention where there's a quality of bliss, of happiness, of equanimity, and an intensification of the wholesome factors of mind. Not to mention, of course, or obviously, the absence of the hindrances. These, these, these states are remote from sensual pleasures. They're re the, the quality of joy is defined as a kind of meditative bliss that supports the unfolding of concentration and the path of practice. And I want to read for you a, a brief paragraph that describes right concentration. This is from the Exposition of the Truths in the Middle Length Discourses, Sutta number 141. And what, friends, is right concentration? Here, and listen carefully, because here you'll hear the description of the four jhanas. And there's a, a real beauty to the language. It gives you a sense of the, these states and the conditions that get, give rise to these states. Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. One enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, one enters and abides in the second jhana, which has confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. With the fading away as well of rapture, one abides in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body, one enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, one enters and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is called right concentration. 
clearly concentration is much more than a mere preliminary exercise that would precede our, our mindfulness practice. Samadhi arises out of a continuity of mindfulness and it develops the factors and the skills that are very conducive to insight. At the beginning of most meditation practices, one of the first instructions we learn is to gather the mind, to collect the attention, to settle our awareness with some particular object, often the breath or a sensation in the body. And this is, of course, a natural instruction because the tendencies of mind is so strong to be distracted and thereby agitated. And often one of the great insights that beginning meditators have is to realize how incredibly distracted and therefore disconnected from life we are. Our minds are often out of control. And in contrast, there can be a deep desire to concentrate the mind, to rein in those distracted tendencies. And in fact, this distractedness of the mind has inspired me to write a third book, which will be published next year in 2022, called Beyond Distractions, working with different strategies to settle the mind, both for the benefit of concentration and insight, and to work in a skillful way with this restlessness and uh, kind of... Um, tendency of the mind to keep thinking and, you know, often in ways that are just not very useful to us. Sometimes meditators are attracted to concentration because, well, we talk about bliss. We describe it as being happy and pleasant. But to develop right concentration, we must know that it is not about gaining a pleasant abiding. It's not about getting to feel rapture and bliss. These are not the aims of our path. It's not the goal of meditation. And it's not the purpose for the spiritual journey. It's important to understand the purpose because very often when meditators get their first taste of deep concentration, the ins they can be very exciting. People can be very inspired. Um, sometimes it feels as though, wow, now the practice is finally working. I am succeeding. And then we mistakenly look to the experiences of concentration as signposts of success and reinforce that deluded stance of selfing with the thought, I got concentrated. We're looking in the wrong direction then to assess our practice. And if that and that very activity of comparing and judging, whether we judge ourselves favorably as being so successful or we judge ourselves unfavorably as being, oh, you know, I can't do this practice, my mind keeps thinking, blah, 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 blah. Either way, this comparing is taking us down the wrong path. Sometimes meditators do feel very proud when they're able to follow 800 breaths in a row. But we have to be careful of how we assess our practice, because there are many beautiful and delightful experiences that come along with the concentrated mind, but those can also be considered to be corruptions of our practice. And many of them we find listed in the Visuddhi Magga as in the list of the 10 corruptions of insight. These experiences are not unwholesome, they're not wrong, they're not bad, but they're not the aim of the path and they have the danger of being potential um, experiences that the mind can cling to or identify with or crave for. And these include an experience of luminosity, of energy and buoyancy in the mind, of equanimity, tranquility, rapture, happiness. So we must look for what uh, and consider what are the real signs of success in our practice and understand that we're developing concentration to liberate the mind from the causes of suffering, the causes in craving, attachment, and clinging. The aim of the path is the end of suffering. And when we remember this, we're not going to be seduced by a little bit of temporary bliss. We're not going to stop short with that sense of, stillness and tranquility 
And we also won't fear the attainment of these states. We won't be afraid to develop them thinking, oh no, I shouldn't experience bliss because I might become attached to it. Now, when we understand the purpose of the path, then we cultivate the wholesome states knowing them as impermanent, useful, powerful, but not to be clung to. Just as with any pleasant activity, the, the meditative states, those blissful states of deep meditation can possibly become the object for attachment, but only if we're developing wrong concentration, concentration based upon wrong view. So when I teach concentration, I emphasize throughout the training right view so that the concentration that we develop is held within the liberating eightfold path. The profound states of calm and tranquility, bliss, concentration, jhana, undeniable, they're, they're attractive, they're delightful. But if we don't look to the pleasant feeling for satisfaction, then we'll be able to harness the power of pleasure, the power of the, the settled, still contented mind so that it supports our liberating path. Concentration is immensely valuable. It's a tremendous support when it's developed with right view on the liberating path. I want to mention a few distortions of concentration and a few common errors that people experience in their concentration practice. Because I've been teaching these, I've been teaching jhana retreats since 2004. And um, I've seen quite a few people uh, experience jhana and quite a few people struggle with it. And there are a few things that tend to arise. And one of them is that the, the, the mind just gets out of balance. This is not a problem. In fact, this is how we develop skill in meditation. This is what we learn about ourselves is we start to learn what out of balance is. And often the out of balance is out of balance with the other awakening factors. So there are seven awakening factors, mindfulness, energy, Invest, sorry, mindfulness, investigation of states, energy, joy, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And as we work with these wholesome states of mind that develop in the course of any meditation practice, certainly every mindfulness-based meditation practice develops these awakening factors, we can sense that they, they need to stay in balance in balance. The arousing factors of investigation, energy, and joy need to be balanced with the tranquilizing factors, the calming factors of tranquility, equanimity, concentration, and equanimity. If they're out of balance, say the concentration gets too strong for the available energy, then the mind's going to go to sleep. And this happens to people very commonly as they're learning to develop the balance of mind and to apply skillful effort. They'll be so gung-ho for the concentration that they develop that factor, the tranquility, the concentration, the focused, and then they go to sleep. There's a dullness, a sloth and torpor that comes in. And it's not really that there was too much concentration. It was that there was too much concentration for the available energy. And so the solution is to boost the arousing factors not to just keep driving towards stronger focus, but to, to learn the skill of keeping the mind in balance. This is very important when we're doing not only concentration, but anything to be able to maintain the energy for the degree of focus that we have. If you're doing a, even a mundane pro, a, a project, you have to stay focused on what you're doing and also maintain a clarity and an energy of mind to be able to continue to persist to accomplish the task. You might wonder, well, how do you know when you have enough concentration for insight practice? Is, can there be too much concentration for vipassana practice? And there can be, there can be, in the sense that this factor can get out of balance with the other factors. 
So this sense of balance is profoundly important to keep the mind steady and alert. Um, it's possible that um, somebody could use concentration to avoid pain or difficulty. I, I have to admit, this is not something I see very often. In fact, I'm trying to think if I actually know anybody who does this. Maybe I can think of one person, but it didn't, maybe two, but it didn't take much to steer them to realize what was actually happening there. So this isn't something that I consider to be a big deal, but it is possible that somebody can be so strong in their practice that they haven't, that they're not really, um, uh, that they're withdrawing from difficulty instead of secluding the mind from unwholesome states. And so we can just look at the quality of our minds and hearts and ask ourselves, does it feel as though the mind and the concentration is bringing a sense of openness, spaciousness, softening? Because that's, those are the qualities of the stillness of samadhi. Or does it feel as though there's a tightness, a restrictiveness, a sense of hardening? If so, we might be pushing experience away rather than opening to be mindful of what's there and then setting it aside. There's a huge difference between pushing something away with aversion or fear and simply turning our attention to, to cultivate something else. We can develop the, the, the strength of focus and the ability to choose how to direct our minds without necessarily without, without um, acting on or directing our attention based upon aversion. Um, the practice that focuses on a single object as many samadhi practices do can develop the, the strong concentration aspect, but it doesn't necessarily um, um, emphasize insights or understanding. So sometimes people come to, um, a, re a retreat being interested in the concentration aspect, but having had a background in concentration practice. And this is common with people who have done decades of mantra practice and have not really learned about insight meditation. And so if I get a student who's been for 20 years focusing on, the, uh, on, the, um, on a mantra or on a fixed object, even though their aptitude for concentration is already developed and it's fairly easy to train them in a new object, a qual an object that would be suitable for absorption, I'm not inclined to do so. I want to establish the mindfulness, some understanding about mind and body phenomena and right view before going deeper into the absorption states of jhana. When we're focused on a fixed object, then very often it feels as though we can sort of settle into a kind of quiet, blissful state of mind. But if the practice isn't paced and guided by a skillful teacher, it might actually seduce us into just maintaining these pleasant states without the liberating component of insight. It's not uncommon for people who haven't, don't have a Buddhist background and don't have the teachings, uh, the, the right view and the teachings of the path to favor pleasant states. I think as you know, animals were conditioned to reach for the reward, to want to linger with what's pleasant. And somebody who doesn't, hasn't established right view might forget the need to actually develop the investigation and understand the nature of phenomena because that would be liberating. So then the mind again, it becomes attached to the pleasure. If one is practicing with wrong view, there's very often an attachment to the pleasure and the mind keeps getting calm, more concentrated, but it's not invigorated with um, the investigation factor. So again, it leads to dullness and to sleep. Now it's true that too deep in concentration and the approach to jhana, we diminish, we downplay the, the cultivation of investigation because we want to strengthen tranquility. 
but we're still developing the tranquility within an understanding of a path that values insight and is based upon enough understanding of how the mind works that we have already skillfully set aside the hindrances, not forcefully suppressed them, but skillfully set them aside. So we have to really consider it if we're developing right samadhi or if we're developing wrong samadhi. And the determination of whether it's right or wrong samadhi is made by checking not how strong our samadhi is, but whether it's affected by clinging and the purpose for which it is developed. I consider right samadhi to be a practice of relinquishment, a practice of letting go. If it's based upon a right view of this path, and it's supported by mindfulness and right effort, and it's fully integrated with the Eightfold Path, then I think we can be pretty confident that we're developing right samadhi, and that we have at hand the reminders and the skills to wear away any residual attachments and clinging into delusions that might um, be creeping in now and then. In the Anguttara Nikaya Book of the Sevens, there's a discourse that specifically says, right concentration is equipped with the other seven factors of the path, of the Eightfold Path. Some of the difficulties and struggles that meditators often have are the same struggles we have with everything else. Sometimes people come to the retreat and have a strong tendency to judge their practice, to compete with other meditators, to assess the rate of their progress, to try and figure out where they are on the path. And it builds up a lot of conceit Sometimes people say, but this is the fourth day of the retreat. I thought by now I would be in the fourth jhana. But I think we have to recognize the corrupting potential of the comparing mind. Practice needs patience, patience to allow the mental factors to mature and the conditions to ripen. We're not just concentrating the mind, we are developing the whole path and allowing it to become ripe so that there's a profound steadiness that is liberating. Just because we've attended a jhana retreat does not mean that we are guaranteed to get into jhana. The majority of people who attend jhana retreats do not get into jhana. These are profound states, profound states in which the mind has resolved its issues with all the hindrances. No unwholesome state arises at all, at all, for sustained periods of time, hours, days, thoughts don't intrude. These are profound states, and I see no reason to try to change the definition of the states to make them easier to attain. They are possible for us. They are available for us, but they are indeed profound states. And just recognizing that they are possible and knowing that there are skills and practices that we can do to cultivate them isn't about getting some attainment of jhana like a badge of success. It's about purifying the mind from all unwholesome states, liberating the mind, from the obsessions of the hindrances. Another issue that comes up is that is the issue with um, the, the, the interaction of insight with a concentration. And some meditators are, are, are always assess, are always in investigating, uh, looking deeply at everything, looking at change, looking at all the different things that are going on and are maintaining an insight mode, are really developing kanaka samadhi and not jhana. Jhana is, suspends that investigation. There's no thought that arises in a jhana state. So there, there has to be a, a flexibility and ability of the mind to know how to direct it, to know what the object is and how to, to hold the object in a skillful way. We might hold it one way for insight practice and another way for samadhi practice. But there's also the problem or the potential problem of not doing any investigation at all. 
And this is really stopping short of the potential of the practice. And I would say this is wrong samadhi. And this is, is in, in, in included in a, or described well demonstrated in a story of that one of my teachers used to often tell of uh, an ancient Rishi who was a really good meditator. And um, he could sit for a long time. So he uh, decided to make himself a cup of tea in his little cave. And so he sat down to make the cup of tea, but it was gonna take a little while for the, the fire to get hot enough and the um, tea to boil. So he thought, well, while it's, while it's heating up, I'll just enter Samadhi. And so he entered Samadhi, but he woke up seven years later or came out of it, emerged from that Samadhi state seven years later. And his first thought was his desire for tea. Where is my tea? And so um, my teacher used to tell this story, not to be impressed by his ability to sit still, but to recognize that the samadhi states did not free the mind from the craving and the desire. But interestingly, samadhi temporarily suspends desire. And it gives us a perspective beyond sensual pleasures, a perspective in which we can understand the limitations and the dangers and the potential attachment to sensual pleasures. So it allows us to experience the peace of desirelessness a happiness born of seclusion. But it's not necessarily born of wisdom. We need to continue. We need to go further. We need to apply our concentrated mind to wisdom because it's wisdom that leads to liberating insight. The Buddhist path of using jhana as a basis for insight integrates the samadhi and the insight together in a liberating practice. And there are interesting vipassana practices that are taught after absorption, after jhana has been established. And they're designed to harness the strength of the refined and steady mind to be able to penetrate experience very deeply. And I um, speak about, I write about these in um, my second book, Wisdom Wide and Deep, that describes a very detailed approach to vipassana practices when that, that can be undertaken when concentration is well established. There are some meditators who are very easily concentrated. It's, it's interesting to watch. You know, every retreat, there's maybe one who takes to it like a duck to water. And some, I think, wow, that's pretty amazing. They're like um, natural. And, or they've done a lot of other work in their life that has developed a steadiness. And they've done the, the basics of maintaining their ethics, of living with a lot, with, with very little to regret, you know, to feel okay, so the mind doesn't, uh, doesn't go into worry. But there are many, many, many people who find focused attention very challenging and jhana practice, well, extremely very challenging. <laughs> And so we must let go of our tendency to compare, to judge, and to compete. We, we need to just value the strengthening of samadhi, the cultivation of concentration, and the development of the wholesome conditions that samadhi rests upon, and allow it to ripen in its own time. Um, there's a, a story of um, Patachara, who is um, one of the early Buddhist nuns. And she um, tells her enlightenment story. And I like it because it includes a strengthening of concentration, but her awakening happened shortly thereafter, as though the concentration cultivated a condition in which the liberation could occur sometime shortly after. She said, when they plow their fields and sow seeds in the earth, when they care for their wives and children, young Brahmins find riches. But I've done everything right. I followed the rule of my teacher. I'm not lazy or proud. Why haven't I attained peace? Bathing my feet, I watched the bath water spill down the slope. I concentrated my mind the way you train a good horse. 
Then I took a lamp and went into my cell, checked the bed and sat down on it. I took a needle and pushed the wick down. When the lamp went out, my mind was freed. Meditation practice is not merely a technology that we can apply to our practice and gain some predictable result on a preset timeline and therefore congratulate ourselves for it. But we can use the methods of meditation, develop the skills that this practice cultivates and create the conditions in our own lives of harmony, of calm, of attention and clarity. At least up to some point. We create the conditions that support insight, but we cannot force or control how insight arises. To develop concentration, we usually need supportive conditions, some quiet, some stillness, uh, conditions in which the mind is undisturbed and undistracted, usually a reduction of stimuli and retreat centers are ideal conditions that are conducive for concentration to arise. When we go to a retreat, we have set aside the entanglements of our world, you know, our activities, our responsibilities. We've, we've in a way removed ourselves from many of the triggers that sustain, that, that feed our hindrances. We've cultivated quietness and have the deep joy, the gladness that comes through the practice of meditation. But whatever concentration we develop in a retreat situation, um, for example, is going to dissipate after the retreat. These are impermanent states. They change as the conditions change. But the temporariness of jhana, of jhana states or deep concentration does not diminish its value or importance for this path to support insight and to realize an awakening, a deep peace that is not dependent upon conditions, the conditions of seclusion and stillness, a peace that is not fixated on any rarefied state that doesn't require any particular meditative focus or any particular kind of perception. The profound unification and stability of mind that comes through the cultivation of concentration, samadhi and jhana practice creates incredibly conducive conditions for liberating the mind through not clinging. It creates the conditions that make the realization of Nibbana likely. Although jhana may not seem immediately accessible, it requires patience and through it, we develop skills. I believe that it is incredibly valuable for our training and worth the effort to develop samadhi. So thank you for your attention for the talk. What I'd like to do is to guide the meditation now focused on the breath. And then we will, I will save time at the end. We'll sit for maybe 30 minutes, maybe a little bit less, 25 minutes, and then we'll have 15 or 20 minutes for your questions. So take a moment to settle yourself in the sitting posture. And although I'm going to suggest that we use the breath as the primary object, I want to begin connecting with the experience right here and right now of the body sitting. Feel the contact with the floor. Feel the contact with the seat. Feel the sensations of where the hands touch. and sense the experience of the spine, upright, elongating, and allow the muscles to relax, the face to relax, the shoulders to relax, the belly to relax. So 
So we connect with the experience that we're having just sitting here. You might tune into the environment. Perhaps there are sounds. Perhaps it's warm or it's cool. I think it's important to connect with the genuine experience right here and right now. To not plunk ourselves down in our meditative seat and then uh, grab a hold of the breath. But first, just settle become still in the body sitting. As you become mindful of this moment as it is, you might begin to narrow the focus of your attention and highlight the breath. Feeling the rise and fall of the belly, although it's a great way of developing insight practice, those sensations are continuously changing. So if we want to put our mindfulness of breathing practice on the trajectory of deep concentration, then I would recommend using, focusing your attention on the breath, but in the area of the nostrils. You might begin with a sensation. How do you feel the breath? Where do you feel the breath? But in the approach to concentration and jhana, it isn't necessary to feel the sensations that arise with each breath. More simply, we know breath. We know the in-breath and we know the out-breath. And we direct our attention to breath. We let our attention meet the in-breath and stay connected through the whole in-breath, the beginning, the middle, the end. And we know the out-breath from the beginning, middle, and end. So we pour our interest and our attention into this knowing of breath.
Let the attention rest into each breath. Settle with each breath. We don't need to change the breath. It doesn't need to be long or short. It doesn't need to be any particular way. We're just connecting this breath. If the mind drifts off into thought, notice, notice that restlessness, notice the seduction of that distraction. And give yourself the opportunity to set it aside and to know this breath, to be fully present for this very simple experience right here, right now. Breathing in and breathing out. Don't let the discursive mind, that distracted tendency, obscure the awareness of breath.
diligently but gently direct your attention to connect with, to know this in-breath and this out-breath. As the attention meets the breath, we can gather the knowing, the sense of the, the whole mind to collect with breath. The thoughts of this and that the other perceptions are not so compelling. We withdraw our interest from them. As those distractions fall away, the mind becomes more still, more steady, spacious and relaxed as we settle in to knowing the in-breath, and the out breath.
Notice the quality of your effort. If it's too slack, boost up the interest, boost up the energy. If it's too forced or you feel constricted and tight, then relax a little. Let the mind be spacious, even as you're focusing on a particular experience like breath. The skillful development of concentration rests upon the skillful adjustments to our energy, our effort, the way we meet, the perception that we're having, the way we meet, in this case, breath. So I welcome any comments, any questions, any topics for discussion related to concentration, jhana, your own practice of stabilizing the attention. And if it's too much for you, and if it's too much for you that particular day. Uh -huh. um, so how you structure the practice, everything that you described is good. Everything, okay. they're all really good. Some people um, uh, like to go, like to include several different kind of like practices within their sitting period. And other people prefer to take one, one practice and uh, expand it out and to, to in, in, you know, like really go work with one more thoroughly. So somebody might say, for instance, um, yeah, I know Samadhi is important. Um, but I, I and it, and I understand it's part of the whole. It's a support for insight. But for the next six months or a year, I'm going to just strengthen the samadhi. I'm going to highlight that, or with the the, the Brahma Viharas, we highlight it for a while, and so we strengthen that particular factor in the context of a broader understanding of our practice. Mm -hmm. So some people prefer to do that, and other people like to do. Um, uh, include many things in their practice. The, there's dangers in both. Like mm -hmm. if you're always including a lot of things, that's fine if you're sitting, you know, 10 hours a day because there's plenty of time to go deep with all of them. But if you're only sitting 30 minutes or an hour a day and you're trying to put four different practices into one sitting, there's the danger that you may never go deep with any of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, but they're all good practices. So you have to sense for yourself whether or not the variety is actually keeping your interest and your energy up. So it's good for now. 
And then mm-hmm. once in a while, just focus on one or another, or whether, um, or whether you're more inclined to want to, um, you know, space it out a little bit. It's individual disposition is most of it, because all the practices that you're describing are, um, are good, but you have to sense for yourself whether you're going deep with them. And we don't want to just shift to the next practice without having gone deep with the one that we're currently doing sitting twice in a day, I would do more of the stabilizing in the morning. I I would tend to because you'll have that potency throughout the day. And one of the side effects of strong concentration practice is that the joy and the energy build and it becomes harder to sleep. Yes. So, um, so in fact, if you're in retreat and doing a jhana practice, you won't be sleeping very much at all you won't have any need for the sleep because the mind will be so deeply rested and energized by the concentration states. So um, so I would agree that if you're doing two sittings in a day to do the samadhi practice first. Generally also, if you're doing say an hour sitting and you want to include say um, mindfulness with breathing or Brahma Vihara practice for the purpose of establishing samadhi, I would tend to do that first Huh. And then move into the insight or the or different satipatthana practices or insight practices simply for the for the same reason that the samadhi gives a big boost to joy and energy, and um, and then it'll be available to sustain and support the um, the insight practices. But we are developing insight and samadhi together. Um, the the an emphasis with samadhi practice is to first you have to clear the mind of the hindrances because there's no samadhi with hindrances those are mutually um, exclusive experiences (laughs) you know samadhi describes a mind that is free from the hindrances so there needs to be enough mindfulness present to clear the mind from the hindrances so that's kind of like a precondition for um for insight I mean, precondition for samadhi. So insight, some some degree of insight is happening there, but we're not like looking at the the arising and passing of phenomena in detail. Mm -hmm. And then you might uh, emphasize uh, samadhi practice, uh, maybe mindfulness with breath, um, um, and then work with an insight practice. Um, so, So you might have those components. You can still do insight with mindfulness with breathing, as you're aware, working with the 16 steps of Anapanasati, some of the steps emphasize more samadhi and some emphasize more insight, but we're still working with breath. Breath is still central in that practice. So, um, so it can, there, there's a lot of good ways, all this is to say, there's a lot of good ways to practice and all the ways you've described sound great. And we don't need to prescribe it. We don't need <laughs> to, to, to be controlling about exactly how it is. Just periodically check that there's both samadhi and insight and that there's a sense of depth that's developing that you're not racing through these practices to try to, like, it, it shouldn't feel like a race. Some people experience, some people are very uh, attuned to the somatic and bodily experience and will experience their mental states and their emotions easily reflected in the body. So it's not uncommon when the mind is getting calm for somebody to feel the body softening, kind of like feeling more receptive and as though the body, uh, it, it, as though the as though the mental state is felt in the body, just as when somebody's angry, the, the body changes too. You know, you might be tuned into the heat or the pressure or the tightness. So as we're developing the mind, there's always the body is with us. You know, the, these these experiences of body and mind arise together. So some people will focus more on the body, and that's not a um, a contradiction for calm abiding, for the development of concentration, for the stilling and settling of the mind. But I would say that the object of the experience of the body does not continue in jhana. The the mind is so absorbed with its meditation subject 
that it is no longer experiencing any change, other changing perceptions, not thoughts, not sounds, not sensations. So in an absorption, in, a, in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, bodily perceptions would not be arising. Um, but the mind experiences kanaka samadhi in relationship to the body. The mind would know um, the, the, the experience of what's called um, upachara samadhi or access concentration and still be in touch with the body. It's only in an absorption because the mind is then absorbed with a single object. This is, in, this is a, an important point in determining and selecting what object you're going to focus on. I say the breath, but I'm, when, I, when we use it for jhana, which is a very specific kind of apana samadhi, but if we're using it for jhana, then we, we're focusing more on the basic occurrence of the breath. We could say it's known as a mental object, not the sensations on, in the, on the skin and not the wind element as the belly rises and falls, but it's just known as breath. And it's, it, the, the attention settles there, and then that develops into um, what, what would be called a, in Pali a patibhaga nimitta. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a refined mental sign of the breath. And that's, that occurs prior to absorption and becomes the object for absorption. So one develops skill with how one holds the object as well as the experience of the still settled mind and those combined to allow the particular perceptions that are defined as first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana. But all the other kinds of samadhi that I'm aware of the body can be included, but not jhana. Thank you. Let's see. But, um, I do think there are certain conditions before I recommend somebody attend a jhana retreat. And it's not required in Asia. I think there are many monasteries where jhana practice would be the first practice somebody would undertake. Um, of course, after one has established virtue, concentration practice, and any meditation practice in the Asian monasteries, first, there would be a lot of practice with generosity, with dana. There would be a lot of practice with virtue with with sila so one would be well established in 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 the joy and the delight and the gladness that comes in our mind that lightness and buoyancy and sense of confidence that is based upon the way that we live you know that openness and responsiveness so there's already a sense of being comfortable with our own minds through our actions and then one would would undertake a meditation practice and it's not unusual to find that um, the, the, that one of the first meditation practices one would be uh, one, one would undertake would be a concentration oriented practice, and uh, because it they're 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 relatively simple in terms of the instructions you know one object focus on it, <laughs> and um, so they're not then there isn't a lot of things you have to learn about in the sense of beginning the practice so you could you could then settle with it and then the wholesome states that come out of it out of the samadhi the stillness the freedom from the hindrances then become very supportive for other 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 insight practices so it's not unusual to find it taught early on um, I tend to not teach it to beginners. I always require that people have had other meditation practice, mindfulness-based practices before coming to a concentration and to jhana retreat because there's only so much that you can teach. The precondition for entering absorption is to have abandoned the hindrances. And most meditators work for years with their hindrances. <laughs> you know, that means that one is not overcome by sensual desire, by anger, by aversion, by the judging mind. Not There's a balance in energy, so the mind is not overcome by dullness or, or restlessness. One has learned how to set thoughts aside, and one is, has the inner confidence, the, the non-doubt. 
So the hindrances have really, we've, we, we've developed already skill with them through our mindfulness practice. So I tend to recommend people to do a jhana retreat after they've gotten to a point in their practice where it's not that they're beyond the hindrances, the hindrances still arise, but they know they have skill with all of them. No, the hindrances don't scare them anymore. Oh, it's like, oh, aversion, seen you 10,000 times before. <laughs> I know how to let you go. <laughs> oh, there's the dullness again, my old friend. Okay, I know how to boost the energy. I know how to shift the attention. And I know how to not judge myself if the mind gets a little sleepy. So you might remember back to when you started meditating, you might have been a lot harder on yourself around the hindrances. They might have felt like big looming obstacles. But as our mindfulness practice develops, they're, they're, they're just wispy little obstacles that are almost silly when they arise in the mind. It's like, oh, I got seduced by that thought. <laughs> Look at that. And, and, and it, it, they don't have much weight to them. So I like people to work with mindfulness to develop a lot of skill with the hindrances before narrowing the field of attention to a single object. So that's my preference. Um, but I don't think it really matters. So long as we're working with it in terms of right concentration and we will apply it to insight, the way that we merge concentration and insight can, um, uh, there's a lot of different ways. In fact, there's a discourse in the, um, I think it's the Anguttara Nikaya. Anyway, one of those Nikayas where the Buddha describes somebody who develops concentration first and then insight somebody else who develops insight first and then concentration somebody else who develops them in pairs and then um and then there's a fourth option which is um is is a little bit more complicated to describe but um there's these clearly it tells us that there can be different approaches and and, and i partially like to um uh, people to have already a mindfulness-based practice before they do um, a jhana practice with me, partly because I, I don't take the time. If I say I'm teaching a 10-day jhana retreat, I want to focus on the teachings of jhana. There's quite a bit there in terms of the nuances of learning the skills of of balancing the attention and learning the skills of how to hold the object and discerning what's happening there. There's, there, it's a very, there's a refinement of the skills. So I don't want to take the time to teach the hindrances. And so from a pedagogical perspective of understanding, I have a limited period of time. Um, I, re I, I require that people already have some, some degree of skill before coming in. And, and, and how long that is, you know, whether it's one year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, it, it doesn't matter. I think we have to keep our practice interesting and, and sense that there's a long run in this practice. For myself, I was meditating for more than 20 years before I did any jhana practice. So, um, so I don't think there's any rush into it, but I, I do think it's a powerful and important and available practice that if you're interested and the conditions are there, it can support your mindfulness practice, it can support your insight practice, and it is part of the liberating practice. And when we see the teachings and when we read the teachings from the suttas that the Buddha taught, I, I think there's no denying that this is an integral part of the Buddhist path. And it is available to lay practitioners. We don't have to go off to some cave. We can seclude the mind sufficiently from the hindrances that it's actually possible for lay people to do this. And we, we also find suttas where the Buddha taught lay people and they experienced jhana, what he called from time to time, you know, periodically. Um, so, you know, one has their job and they go do their work, but then they, they learn to settle the mind and absorption as well from time to time. Thank you. Well, I think we've come to the conclusion of our time, but I do hope that, um, that this has been useful for you and that your reading of the book is useful. And um, I have good wishes for all of you. Thank you. So much for being here, Shaila. It's really a great honor to host you and hope you come back. <laughs> and before we all run away, 
Um, just a reminder that Common Ground oper operates exclusively on the generosity of people just like us. And so if you'd like to contribute to Shyla's livelihood tonight, you can, um, I posted a link in the chat. You can go directly to the website to make a donation and Shyla will make sure she gets two thirds of the donations that are offered tonight. So thank you again, Shyla and everybody for being here in the good conversation and practice, especially on this um, momentous day. Great, thank you. And, and if I can just add, um, if you're interested in looking at the jhana factors, I do have a course um, that's gonna be an online course on the jhana factors. And you can participate from any time zone because we have a lot of recorded guided meditations, recorded teachings, as well as weekly conference calls that are live with me to be able to, to discuss the material and, um, and ask your questions. So I hope you'll consider joining us. Registration is only open for a week, one more week, and then it closes. So please follow the link that's in the chat box to bodhicourses.org. I just love to, um, to see you guys in the class and to continue to work with um, uh, these, um, this theme. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care.